All right, guys, thanks for coming. Today we're mainly going to be going over some more of programming assignment four. We'll open up for questions, and then I have a few details that will probably be helpful that we didn't get to last week that we'll also go over. Just a reminder, this programming assignment's due a week from tonight. So if you haven't started it, you should. It's going to take more than a day to do. So start early, um, especially if you think you might have questions. The likelihood of me answering questions on the discussion board <coughs> decreases drastically as we approach the due date. So get your questions in early. Looking beyond that, this is going to be the last recitation where we're really talking about this. Next week's recitation, we'll be talking about programming assignment five. That will be released <laughs> next Wednesday. You have a week and a half to finish it. So don't okay. wait till last minute on this stuff. You've got a lot to get done in the next four weeks. Start it sooner rather than later. That'll have a week and a half, so it's essentially due two weeks from this Friday, and then that last week of class will be your final problem set, and then you have time on that. So, I'm sure you're all thrilled about this, but go get them. Logistical questions? Okay, so, like I said last week, it is in fact now there. Everything you need to program in Summit 4 is on the Moodle. You should be looking at it. Uh, obviously, make sure you read the entire PDF first. Because we're using this in a simulator, there's some overhead to learning what's going on in the simulator. That's all described in the PDF. We'll touch on that a little bit more today. The files are all in the zip file here. You can download them. You can also pull the files from GitHub, which is actually where they're more up to date. Uh, I'm going to be updating these files this evening. I made a few changes. The up-to-date stuff's already on GitHub. You're welcome to start with these. Nothing drastic changes, but I added some details in a few places that isn't on this version, it will be later this evening. There's a submission link, uh, as always, and then there's the link to the GitHub repo, which, like I said, is where you can find the most up-to-date stuff, if you're curious about it. We'll be adding a grading session scheduler to go with this programming assignment by the end of the week. We'll try to have you guys sign up by next Wednesday, uh, and then grading sessions will be Thursday and Friday of next week, as well as the first half of the fall. So as soon as you guys see that go out, please do sign up in a timely manner. Uh, we're getting toward the end of the semester here, so there is less leeway for not scheduling a grading session on time and all such things. We're trying to fit stuff into a small period of time. So make sure you're on top of all of this and that you're actually starting on this programming assignment. You'll want to do that now or if you haven't already. We good? Okay. So, before I get into what I was going to talk about, is there anyone here that has, has started the programming assignment and has questions on it that they want to ask? I'm just having trouble like figuring out where to start for a predictive algorithm. Do you have any like basic ideas? Uh, we yeah, follow? we'll talk about it in the second half of the lecture. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, let me go over a few points that people have emailed me about that I guess are probably sources of confusion and would behoove you to avoid. The first is when you're writing, and we'll pull up some code later and look at this, we looked at it last week, but you guys need to remember that the part of this program you're writing is just a single function that's getting called repeatedly from the higher level simulator. You really just need to do, your, you should structure your code such that you do more or less one thing or really one thing per process, each call to that each call to your function. Um, you may need to do more than one thing per process, but it's best not to try to do that in the same iteration of the function, because you need other stuff to happen globally in order for you to actually get anywhere. So do one step in that iteration of the function, wait for the function to come back, and then do something different the next time you hit that function. You can still maintain a state across function calls by using static variables, which is what you're going to want to do. Um, but you need to kind of get into the mind of thinking, you're not the guy writing main anymore. You don't have to embed a bunch of local loops to do things over and over again and stuff maybe to cover multiple processes. You really should be trying to do one thing per process for each call to your function, assuming that you'll get other calls to your function down the road that'll allow you to do other things down the road. So this is where, I mean, you're not going to want to be trying to, obviously, if you call page in inside your function and then want to page it out again later, I mean, calling that in the same iteration of the function is useless uh, because if you didn't let the simulator go off and do some useful work, that request never would have completed in the first place. So scope down what you're doing inside your function. Think more on the, you're going to get called over and over again, you're probably going to have more have a bunch of cases, and you're going to have a bunch of big embedded loops and stuff like that. 
uh, you're already getting called inside someone else's big loop. So you've got to go into it with that in mind. So the other side of this is kind of the states that pages can go through, which can be a little bit confusing until you look at it. Like we talked about last week, uh, the simulator runs a series of processes where each process has access to 20 pages of virtual memory. And corresponding, you can get access to the page map for each process that tells you which of those 20 pages is swapped in and which is swapped out. So if we assume this is our, we have a process that has this page map. So these are the 20 possible pages it can use. There's an array that we get past each time our pager function gets called that basically the index of the array refers to the page number, and each page then is given either a zero or a one, depending upon whether or not that page is swapped in or swapped out. Where a one tells us this page is swapped in, a zero tells us it's swapped out. So this is kind of how we can analyze uh, exactly what the state of each page in our page table currently is. Like we talked about last week, our program counter is going to be pointing to some location in memory that's going to be stored in one of these pages. And if our program counter is effectively on a page that is swapped out, we can't do any useful work. So if our program counter is here, we're OK. That's already swapped in. It means we can keep running our code. No action is maybe necessary, depending upon what we're doing with prediction. But there's no immediate action necessary. Um, whereas if we're down here and this page is swapped out, we can't do anything until we go through the effort of swapping this page in. Where, in order to swap this page in, we may find we don't have any spare pages. We have to swap another page out first so on and so forth. But one of the things you're going to have to pay attention to throughout this assignment is kind of the state of these pages. This page map gives you half the state. It tells you whether or not the page is swapped in or swapped out as far as you're concerned, right? A one means that you can do useful work on that page, a zero means you can't. But there's really another side to the state of each of these pages <coughs> that you don't really have direct access to. If you need access to it, you're going to have to come up with ways to that yourself. And that's what's going on with any of these pages at any given time. The pages that are ones, they don't really have anything going on. They're swapped in, there's nothing happening. But these zeros could have a swap in or a swap out operation effectively pending on them. So they could be in the process of swapping in or in the process of swapping out. Remember, it takes X amount of time for a swap in or a swap out to actually complete after you request it. So we could be sitting here waiting on page 19. The first time we realized we were here, we probably made a call to page in, moving to page in this page. The next call to our function, this is still going to be zero. In fact, it's probably going to be zero for the next 100 calls to our function because it takes 100 ticks for this to actually change from a zero to a one after you call that, that initial time. Now, there isn't really any harm in calling page in on this over and over again because page in will just return one if a page in process is already, it doesn't like restart it. It's already in progress, it'll just send back a one so you can effectively ignore it. Um, but there is an issue when this happens in the opposite direction, which we'll look at. So, there's an additional part to the state of each of these pages, which is kind of what's going on. So this could be in the process of being swapped in, it could be in the process of being swapped out, or it could just be static. There could be no pending operations on it right now. People kind of clear with that. So if we consider these two pieces of state for each page, what its current state is, being the zero or the one, and then what its pending, any pending operations, what's going on with it, then we can kind of affect, uh, we can effectively build a state transition diagram that takes us through all of the states we could possibly be in. Uh, and paying attention to where you are in this diagram is going to be helpful so you don't end up doing things like calling page out way more than you need to because you don't realize you're just waiting on a page to come in. Um, so, Effectively, uh, you have four effective states that are the combination of all the relevant, these relevant two metrics. Where this is the state where you are currently paged out. So if you looked in that array, you'd be a zero and you have nothing going on. So that would be maybe something like this page up here. It's currently paged out. If we haven't called page in or page out on it recently, then it's just in a static state. It's paged out. There's no pending. The next state that we tend to care about is we're still paged out, but we've now made a call to page in. So this page is currently paged out, but it's somewhere in the process of getting paged in. And if we wait long enough, it'll switch to paged in. So we are paging in, which, like we said, if we wait long enough, this state will eventually be 
to this state down here, where we are now paged in, and we're back to nothing's going on. We're just paged in. There's no real pending operation on us. And then there's the final state we kind of care about, which is what happens after we call page out on this. And this is kind of the subtle point. We'll go into it here in a sec. Um, when you call, when you have a page that's paged out and you call page in on it, it takes 100 ticks before the value in this array changes. If you have a page that's paged in and you call page out on it, you effectively lose access to it immediately. Although it won't be for 100 ticks until you can repage it in for something else. So this immediately switches back to paged out. But we are now paged out in the process of completing that page out. So in this state, we can call page in, and it'll execute. It'll effectively a call to page in will bring us to this state. This takes one tick to effectively occur, to go to get to the point where we are actually in the paging in state. So one tick after we call page in, the next iteration through, we will have our, our request will have registered. It'll still be marked as paged out, but it'll be in the process of paging in. There's, like I said, the only way to track this is to kind of pay attention to what you've been calling. You don't have any access to this directly, but the simulator or the system on the back end is going through the effort necessary to page this page in. This state transition occurs automatically 99 ticks after this. So it takes 100 ticks total after you call page in, one tick to kind of start everything, and then 99 ticks to complete it. So with no further action, any, any page in this state given enough time, will transition into this state. Does that make sense? So when a page is in this state, if you call paging in on it again, paging in is still going to return 1, which is the successful return, because you're currently in progress. If you call page out on a page in this state, it's going to fail. It will return 0, because you can't page out a page that's currently being paged in. There's already a paging operation underway. When we get down to this state, we are now paged in. We could call page in. It'll just return 1, because we're already paged in, so there's nothing to do. Um, and we can call page out. And if we're in this state and we call page out, page out returns successfully and effectively transition us into this state. So we make a call to page out. And again, if we call page out and then immediately look at this array, nothing will change. But if we call page out, wait till the next call to our function, and then look at this array, that page will immediately be marked as paged out. But it won't be done paging out. So it will be marked as paged out, but the paging out operation will still be underway. So we can't use this page, because it's now paged out, but we also can't swap it back in, because it's in the process of paging out. So it's not until, again, effectively 99 ticks after this process starts that it actually completes and gets back to the state that we can call page in. If you try to call page in when you're in this state, page in is going to fail because you already have a paging operation in process. So a call to page in here will essentially lead to a failure. Um, same as a call to page out here. It's only in these two states that you're going to effectively complete calls to page in and page out. Okay. If we call page out while we're in this state, it's just going to return 1, because it's already paging out. That's nothing to worry about. But the place this gets you into trouble is if you're using this array alone to figure out what pages are available to page in, you might go searching through this array. You're going to land on this page. You go, oh, that's a 0. I can page that page in. Or this is a 0. I can page this page out which might be fine, but if a paging out operation is already occurring on it, it'll still be zero. And now if you go to call page in, you could try to call page in on this if paging out operation is already occurring, and our page in is now going to fail, it'll return to zero. There's only two times our page in really fails. One is if we don't have any available pages, so all 100 of your pages have already been allocated. The other is if you call page in when a paging out happens. If you assume that the only time a page in will fail, is not this case, it's only when you're out of pages, then you're going to make a lot of, you're going to essentially, it tends to lead to calling page out too many times. Because you may have a page that's getting swapped out. So say we land, say page four is swapped out when we need it. So we land down here on page four, 
we we go to swap in page four. We don't have any spare pages. So before we can swap in page four, we have to swap out something like page two. So we have an algorithm that decides page two is the one to swap out. That's great. So we start all of this. Page two is swapping out. So page two is now sitting in this state. Page zero is still sitting in this state because we can't even call page in successfully until we wind up with this spare page. We now come through again and we hit this process again. We're in the exact same state. We look at this, we go, oh, we need this page. It's currently swapped out. I still need to swap it in, great. I can't do that, I'm out of pages. If our algorithm brings us back to this same page again, we're gonna now get here, we try to call page out, we're good. But if we get into a situation where we're not really, if we're not keeping track of the fact that we're already in a state transition and we land on a different page, we might effectively end up paging out pages that aren't necessary to page out. Because we're waiting on this, that's not going to be reflected for 100 ticks. If we don't really take that into account, you could wind up in a situation where you call page out. It's not necessarily going to break anything, but it's going to be super inefficient. It'll be sort of thrashing. Yeah, you could, you're going to end up paging out way more than you need to. Um, if you don't kind of account for the fact that these are the different states you can be in, and that's what can happen. And the biggest issue, like I said, tends to be when something's in the process of paging out and you go to call page in on it, it returns a failure, not because you're out of pages. You may have just enough pages. It returns a failure because you're waiting on that page to do something else. So you may run into situations where you kind of need to go to the effort to keep track of this additional piece of state for each page uh, in order to effectively do things with it. There are other ways to get around this, but this diagram is something you need to be thinking about when you're thinking about what operations you can perform on a page. Um, to ensure you don't fall into essentially what becomes a thrashing scenario where you're not doing any useful work, not because you don't know how to do useful work, but because you're assuming pages are in the wrong state in this table. This array alone can only tell you whether you are, I mean, it really tells you nothing. This table alone will only tell you whether you are in this state or whether you are in one of these three states. To disambiguate between which of these three states you're in, you've got to be doing something to track this additional piece of information. Questions on that? If you haven't started this yet, it might have totally lost you, but maybe this will make sense when you run into a situation that gets you in trouble if you don't account for this. All right? Okay. So. I'll draw up a copy of this and put it into the report, and it'll be in that update that I put up tonight. Um, but do account for, realize that the array, the state in the array alone does not necessarily tell you everything you might want to know about the state of the page. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about some solutions which we touched on a little bit last week. That's the last I'm gonna kind of say about the overview of the simulator and the environment you're working in. So if there's any questions on that, now would be the time to bring them up. Is, sorry, is, uh, is the Minix being provided as a separate virtual machine or what are we doing that? There's no Minix at all. Oh, it's, it's This not. replaced. This were completely replaced that? Yes. Oh, I thought we were doing a Minix, okay. No. All right. All right. I got however right. simulated <laughs> you may, however <laughs> painful you may think this simulator is, and it really shouldn't be, it has a pretty simple okay. API, but it's way less painful than the Minix assignment you would have been doing otherwise. Right. It's going to be a user space. Yeah, so it's oh, cool. Cool. There's no Minix involved. Last year we did this version of the assignment using Minix, which is a, a teaching OS, which is fine. And so if you guys have never used Minix before, the learning curve is kind of steep to yeah. figure out for one assignment. Um, also, there's no GUI, and you only have VI on it, and all of this other stuff that makes development exciting. Yeah, when I talked to that around like a month ago, he wasn't sure if we were yeah, we, to swap it out with the best one. We got rid of it and replaced it with this tool. Any other questions before we get into strategies? OK. So last week, we looked at a really simple implementation that essentially avoids the paging issue altogether because it only ran one process at a time. And if you're only running one process at a time, you always have enough pages. You can essentially give the process all of the pages it needs, let it run, and we go to the next process. It didn't score very well, which is what we'll look at again. Um, we'll run it again later, but the score you get on it would essentially give you no real credit. Your score on the 40% part of this assignment is based solely on the performance of your solution. Um, so you need to perform well if you want a good grade on that part of the assignment. 
The next place you would go, or the first solution you guys will probably end up implementing is a least recently used solution. And we're going to ask you to submit a least recently used solution regardless of, I mean, this, this will probably be your fastest. Predictive will do way better. But you need to write a least recently used solution period. It's part of what you need to turn in, so you might as well start there. The goal behind the least recently used solution, it doesn't really do anything with what pages we're swapping in, but it helps decide which pages to swap out when we need to. So in the least recently used solution, we don't generally swap in a page until the program counter lands on it and turns out we need it. But if we get to the place where we have to swap in a page, there are no spare pages, then the page we get rid of is the, so some measure of the oldest page, or the page we access the least recently. Um, there's kind of two variants of a least recently used solution. You could implement one, both, or whichever one you think is going to perform better. The first variant of a least recently used solution is kind of the global variant, where you got to remember we have 20 processes um, and a total of 100 pages. So in a global variant, when it comes time to swap out a page, the page you're going to pick, so you're going to swap out all this, and you can decide what that means. Uh, you're going to swap out the oldest, uh, the oldest global page. So to do this, you got to realize you're going to have to search through all 20. You have to search through the page maps of all 20 processes to effectively find which page you want to swap out. Um, it's kind of the simplest solution, which is the pro of it. All you got to do is you got to go through all of these. You got to go through all of these processes. You got to go through all their pages. You got to identify which process has the oldest page and then swap out that page. Downside to global is a couple of things. Uh, it tends to have a little performance penalty because it allows crosstalk. This is a paging algorithm where the need of a page by one process can detrimentally affect another process. You might have another process that's blocking for some reason, and its page is the oldest, but it might be the page that it's actually sitting on. And you're not going to know that when you're on process 1. If the oldest page is on process 20, even if that's a page that process 20 may use, you have no way of knowing that right now because your knowledge boundary is just for process one. So in a global one, you could go swap out a page from another process, not knowing anything about whether or not that process uses it. You're making your decision solely on it being the oldest, um, which might damage your performance overall. Or it might not. It kind of depends on what's going on. The alternative to doing a globally search LRU is essentially doing a local or a per process LRU. Where the goal behind this is, you don't really worry about this 100 page, 20 process global space at all. Instead, you're going to pre-allocate a subset of each of these pages to every process, and those are going to be the only pages that process uses. Thus, those will be the only pages that process needs to search when you have to pick one to swap out. So, I mean, the obvious solution, you have 20 processes, 5 pages, means that right off the bat, you get 5 pages per process, right? So if you just pre-allocate five pages to every process, then when you need to swap out, you're not even going to look at other processes. You're only going to say, well, I only, have five, or I only have five pages for my process. When this process needs a new page, if all five of those pages are already in use, I'm going to find the oldest page within this process to set, and that'll be the one that I swap out. Um, so you will swap out the oldest process. So this solution tends to be a little more complicated, but it has better locality because now the only pages you're dealing with are you're, you're kind of maintaining a set of pages for each process, which means you're going to have less crosstalk, which could be detrimental. Um, does that kind of make sense? Your two main options here. This solution is a little bit more complicated. One because you have to track to make sure that you don't exceed. I mean, keep in mind your page in function will only tell you if you're out of global pages. It won't tell you if you're exceeded your five, that's completely up to you. So you kind of have to track the total number of pages you've allotted to each process and make sure you stay within your limit. The other thing you have to do is this 20 is not constant, and it's suboptimal to assume that it is. So as processes exit, at some point you're going to be down to 15 processes, you're going to be down to 10 processes. When, when half the processes exit and you only have 10 left, you want to make sure you're up to 20 pages per process, right? The number of pages per process is going to be a dynamic value that optimally you want to check depending on how many processes are still active versus how many have completed. So, like I said, you can try one or both of these solutions. 
one does tend to perform a little bit better than the other, at least with the set of test programs here. But um, give them a whirl. We'll look at a solution that I have like on or, or not the code for it, but the performance of it. So that's kind of the two main paths you can go down for LRU. I, I don't think there's a whole lot more interesting you can do with LRU beyond one of these two things. Are there questions on this? Why is it necessary to kind of have the um, like the per process like this process should only have you know, five? I guess so. I I kind of implemented something like this, but I didn't really say well. You know, so you're saying process. only swap out pages from a process, but don't limit the process to five? Yeah. Uh, you you could do that, but it's gonna it's a deadlock issue. It is. It could conceivably deadlock because you could start a process, right? I mean, you could get into a situation where, so it probably will work because you're gonna get lucky. Because um, survey, but, but it is gonna prevent a starvation issue because you could now essentially, your most active process is gonna be able to hog all the pages, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, it, if, if this process requests 20 pages for any other process is run, then it's now gonna have 20 pages. Whereas the process to run later, when they need pages, if they only, so the question is, how, what do you do, if you are a process that needs a page and you have zero pages, who do you swap out a page from? I mean, that's a case that you're gonna to need to handle somewhere in there. Because you can't swap out one of your own pages, because you don't have any pages. So the question is, it, it's the crux of that solution comes down to how you handle that case. Yeah, I mean, you can do all types of things. So you could effectively just, so what you're effectively doing if you haven't thought about this, is you're probably just, blocking processes completely until they get at least one page. Because once they have one page, then yeah, you can just search locally. But if you have no pages, what's a local search even mean? Right. So there are hybrids to this, but you probably want to be thinking about what's happening in the case where you have no pages and there's already 100 pages in use. What do you do? Other questions? OK. So, oh, I guess I, where, where are we getting the, uh, the current number of running processes? You're going to have to solve for it. That's just the order. We're not going to answer that. So, you're given that array. When your page is called, you're given an array that has basically the state. It's an array of 20 elements that says the state for each of the 20 processes. One of the variables in that struct is an active, that if the process is still running. so. You effectively have to loop through that array and count the number of active processes if you want to find the total number of running processes at any given time. So it's easy to get, but it's not handed to the yeah, guess it based on instruction location within a range or something. Like this one's paged in, so maybe it's actually running. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. That's I just want to predict your stuff. You right. can to figure out the number of active pages very quick. Also, when a page exits, the PC just resets to zero. Right. But there is an act, there's a variable that tells you whether or not each process is running. You just have to loop through the processes to check that variable and sum it. All right. Are they all starting as? Active? I mean, I, I guess yes. this is more. It so. only goes from active to right. Okay. They're all started as active, but they're all started as blocked. Right. Because they all start with their PCs at zero, which is on their first, I mean, they all start on their first page, and the yeah, so they start with no pages swapped in. Okay. So they're all blocked, waiting on a page to become available. But yeah, they all start running. It's not like it delays the run on something. Right. And they will all attempt to run in parallel. The simulator assumes you essentially have 20 processors. Um, they will attempt to run in parallel, assuming you can make sure they all have an everything. They're all page faulting. Yes. You essentially start out in a state of 20 page faults. Any other questions? OK. So a good LRU solution, we'll look at this here in a little bit when I pull mine up. Um, a good LRU solution will get you, so, so it's, your goal is to get as many out of 40 as you can. 60% of your assignments still comes from your grading session, but 40% comes from your performance. So an LRU solution, if done cleverly, will put you in the 20 out of 40 range. Uh, so you're not going to do better than half credit on that with an LRU solution. Um, you're going to have to get more intelligent. So the next phase of solutions comes in with essentially the whole range of various predictive, predictive solutions. Um, where predictive solutions aren't necessarily mutually exclusive from LRU solutions, 
When we talk about predictive solutions, we're talking more about clever ways to decide which page to swap in. When we're talking about things like LRU solution, LRU solutions, we're talking about clever ways to decide which page to swap out. So there are ways to kind of mesh these together. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some predictive solutions. Now, the sky's kind of the limit on this, and there's tons of clever stuff you can do. So don't feel like what I'm saying today is even the best stuff to do. It's just some ideas of where you might want to start. So in the realm of predictive solutions, you can kind of sort predictive solutions into two high-level categories, where you have a class of no-knowledge solutions, and we'll talk about what that means, and then you have a class of knowledge-based solutions. So a no-knowledge solution is a predictive solution that doesn't require any special information about the processes that are going to be running. This is the state we're almost always in the real world, right? It's not like you buy a processor that only runs three programs, or that only knows how to run three kinds of programs. You buy a processor that will run anything you throw at it. So by definition, anything clever that the processor of the OS does can't really assume that it knows you're going to be running Microsoft Word, or it knows you're going to be running a specific <coughs> program. Um, Knowledge-based solutions take the opposite approach. These, you don't necessarily see a whole lot in the real world, but for the purposes of this assignment, you can actually do some interesting things. So you do see these sometimes if you have like special purpose hardware that's only ever going to be running one thing at a time, um, or that you know exactly what code the hardware is going to be running. But a knowledge-based solution basically assumes it knows what program is going to be running, and then tries to exploit that knowledge to do better than you could do otherwise. So, in the realm of no-knowledge solutions, I mean, there's some crossover here, but the simplest no-knowledge solution would be a linear predictor, which we'll talk about here in a sec. Um, other forms of no-knowledge solutions, uh, you, can, you can do heuristic-based solutions. And we'll talk about those. Knowledge-based solutions are almost all some type of heuristic-based solution. Um, so let's talk about what a linear solution is. Uh, so a linear predictor essentially makes the assumption that often in programs, the program counter proceeds linearly, right? If you don't have any branches, you don't have any if statements, if you don't have any loops, your program counter tends to just keep ticking down through memory until it gets to the end of the program. People okay with this? So the goal of a linear predictor is to essentially, if we make the assumption that this is a predominant behavior in programs, then it becomes advantageous for us to swap in pages before we get to them, assuming that we will get to them eventually. So you can imagine a situation where if this is our memory space, and we'll divide it into pages of maybe constant size, so if these are our memory space, these are our different pages, and our program counter is sitting up here. So our least recently used solutions, and the non-predictive solution we've looked at the past, if this page is swapped in, this page is swapped out, and this page is swapped out, the solutions we've been dealing with, like LRU, this page is swapped in, that's great, it's going to keep ticking through it, it's going to get down to this page, this page is swapped out, so now we're going to have to sit here for 200 ticks, or, or at least 100 ticks, because it'll take 100 ticks to swap in a page. If we don't have a page to swap in, we have to swap out another page first, it's going to take us 200 ticks. So we're stuck waiting here for this page to become available to essentially the necessary machinery to allow it to go through the transition from a 0 to a 1, right? The goal of, predictive, uh, the goal of a predictive um, allocator is to avoid this issue altogether. We're sitting up here. It shouldn't really be a big surprise that we're going to need this page soon. Right? If you're making the linear assumption, we're moving toward this page, we're within x distance of it, we're probably going to need this page. So why should we wait until we land on this page to start swapping it in? We know swapping in is going to take some background time, so when we're up here, we know this is going to be the next page, it probably makes sense for us to start swapping it in when we're up here. So then, we go to here, we go to here, and while we're doing this, time's elapsing, and if we get lucky, or if we really it's not luck at all, it's if we do this soon enough, by the time we actually hit this page, it's already swapped in. And now we don't have to wait at all. It's not that we were able to swap in the page any faster, it's that the time we spent swapping in the page wasn't when we needed it, so we weren't stuck blocking. 
It still is going to take us 100 to 200 ticks to swap in this page, but if we start swapping it 100 to 200 ticks up here before we get to it, then by the time we get to it, that swap will be complete. Same deal, we're here right now, we're going to assume that this will be the next page. So we'll start this page transition, we're going to take down through here, so and so forth, and if all goes well, and we started this soon enough, this will complete before we even land on this page. So effectively, we don't have to spend any time blocking at all. So that's a linear predictor. Now, this obviously breaks down. If we get right here, and this instruction is something like a for loop, and now my program kind of bounces back up to here, then all I've done is swapped in a page that I may never need. I mean, I may never need. It may do this 10 times in the next exit. So it's not perfect, and for certain programs, it might have to behave worse. Because now I've had to swap in a page I'm never going to need. That means that someone else, I mean, these pages aren't free, right? Swapping in this page means that I had to take a page away from someone else that they could have maybe been using. So a linear predictor is a good place to start. Programs, even if they have things like loops, like within this loop, this prediction would still help us, right? It would help us between these two pages. So a linear predictor still tends to do much better than anything like an LRU solution will, and it, it's probably the place you want to start in terms of predictive algorithms. But there are certain situations where it may still cause crashing because you have a program that's highly nonlinear that has a whole bunch of jumping and branching. Kind of questions on goal of linear predictor? Okay. Now, like I said, this is not necessarily mutually exclusive from an LRU. This linear predictor, when it, it all it's really paying attention to is now instead of just dealing with the page we're on, which you can't forget about, by the way, just because you're being clever and swapping in these pages, if you land on a page that's zero, you still have to handle that case, or you're going to get stuck. But in addition to handling the immediate page that we're on, where hopefully it'll always already be swapped in, you also are handling future pages, but that doesn't tell us anything about what page we're trying to swap out. If we get down to here, and this is a zero, we know we're coming up on this, we decide we want to make this a one. If we have to swap out a page, we still need a strategy for which page to swap out in order to make the page available for me to swap in here. So you could use this in conjunction with LRU. Part of the process of doing this could be finding the oldest page, swapping it out to make the page available, and then doing this. This kind of then becomes all of the machinery that you were doing in your LRU situation. It's just instead of doing it when you land on the page, you're now doing it when you land on the page and for the page that you're going to land on next. So they're really good with the predictive ones. Uh, recognize early, or early enough when they made a misprediction and correct for it, or is it generally they failed and then have to wait in the case? I mean, so you can get more complicated, but generally if you're doing strictly a linear algorithm and you fail, you're going to end up landing on it. You're going to have page faults still. Yeah. yeah. Um, it gets, I mean, you can get more complicated, but then it's not really linear anymore, right? Yeah, like if it can predict as misprediction, then it's a lot more yeah. than a linear yeah. predictor. Yeah. Um, a linear predictor only has one possible prediction it can make yeah. the pages that are coming up. Okay? So you can use this in conjunction. I mean, you can build this on top of like an LRU solution or on top of any other policy for what page gets paged out. We just added an additional constraint as to when we're going to page page in. So other strategies that you tend to look at, um, we won't go into real detail on any of these other ones, but essentially the crux of all predictive strategies are you're finding some way to track the PC and make a clever prediction about it. In a linear algorithm, in a linear predictor, you're tracking which direction the PC is moving and where it is, and that's controlling what you're going to predict next. In other, uh, in other allocators, you're going to track the PC. So a heuristics-based um, predictor essentially tries to determine something about the structure of the program. Now, you can do this in a knowledge-based way, which you can actually do on this assignment, because we told you each of the 20 processes is one of five types of programs, so you know what the five programs are. So in the extreme, a heuristic-based algorithm is going to monitor the PC over time and say the PC it's something like it moved down, and then it moved back up, and then it repeated this again. So it's going to monitor the PC over some number of time steps. It's then going to try to say, well, of the five possible programs, there's only one program that has a loop that looks like this. So now I must know it's this program. Once I know it's this program, I can make more intelligent predictions about where it's going to go next, since I know what's running. Um, 
that's kind of the extreme case of a heuristic-based algorithm. And to really do that perfectly, it requires you to know what programs you have, which for this assignment you do, in real life you often don't. But just because you don't have that knowledge in real life doesn't mean heuristics are useless. Things like for loops are pretty common in programming, right? And as it turns out, we rarely call a loop twice. We often call it way more than twice. That's the whole point of having it in the loop. So one form of doing a kind of a heuristic-based thing is to look for loops. So instead of having a linear predictor, you now have a loop predictor, where you essentially watch the PC, and any time the PC does something like this and then loops back up to here, you just saw the PC loop, you're going to assume that maybe you watch it twice. You see that happen once, you see that happen again, you go, well, the PC traverses this exact same area twice. It's probably going to do it a lot more than twice. Because you're going to say, uh, once you hit a loop two times, you're way more likely to hit it 100 times than you are to hit it just two times. So once you've seen this twice, then you're going to say, well, I better just make sure every page of this loop touches stays swapped in, or something like that. You can do the same thing with branch statements. If you routinely see the PC do something like this, and then it skips some space and does this, and you see this happen a lot, then you might want to say, well, these are pages that I just want to keep swapped in, because I seem to be having some branch that's going to hit them. In real life, you can also, you can actually look at more than the PC. You can look at the instructions that are coming up. You can't actually do that in this simulator because there aren't any real instructions. So you may, if you're looking about stuff up on the internet, you may come across some strategies that require you to actually like look at the assembly code that's coming up. You just don't have the ability to do any of that. You can't do anything that requires you to dereference any of this memory because there is no real memory. It's all a simulator. But you can do clever things with tracking where the PC's been to try to predict where it's going next. Um, and whether you do it in the extreme case and try to narrow it down to one of a set of processes and then make really specific predictions, or you can do it in the, maybe you just sort all processes into one of three kinds of processes. A process that loops a lot, a process that's mainly linear, or a process that branches a lot. And then you have a linear predictor to handle one of those, a loop predictor to have or handle another, and a branch predictor to handle a third. So the goal with heuristics is basically to try to narrow down kind of what type of behavior the process is showing, and then apply a predictor or apply a strategy that's more optimal for that type of behavior. All right? So you can get really clever in this. Um, you can go a long ways. Some other knowledge-based solutions, there's states-based solutions, which I don't recommend starting here, unless you have like a lot of linear algebra control theory background. But you can totally nail this assignment by doing something like this, uh, if you know what you're doing. But not an easy place to start. Stick with the other stuff. Um, the goal of this is you basically know what five programs are going to run. You can map out the state map for all those processes. You can see where the state maps overlap and essentially predict the optimal state flow of every possible thing you can need at every possible point. <coughs> it's really clever. It only works in knowledge base if you know what programs are running. But since you do here, you can do something like that. Things to look into. Um, uh, so we only have five programs. So process one is running program true and process. They're two. randomly distributed across the 20 processes. Yeah. Yeah, but what I was saying is like is page one for process four if it's running program two the same as um, page one for process five that's running program two? You know what I'm saying? Did that matter about it? Doesn't really make sense. Um, um, they're also you know the five programs, but they are probabilistic. And each instantiation of it's probabilistic. So like the likelihood of a branch occurring is going to be different. So although you may have the same program running through processes, they may not take exactly the same paths. And thus, their maps or their states are not going to be necessarily identical. Does that kind of answer what you're going for? Okay. Is there a way to pipeline instructions? Um, no. I mean, that's effectively what you're doing by, I mean, effectively you have 20 processes. So they're all running simultaneously. In other words, like the pipelining is happening for you. I mean, in some ways, a linear algorithm is pipelining because you're ensuring that what you need next is already loaded into the system. I mean, a linear bridge is really a type of pipelining. You're doing the work you need to do in parallel with when you don't need it, so that when you get to it, it's already there. Any other questions on this? If you've never done anything like this before, start here and build on it. Um, because you can do pretty well with something like this, assuming you do it right. In all of these, if you make a mistake, all bets are off, right? I mean, if you're doing something silly like swapping out pages way more frequently than you need to because you're not paying attention to the state, 
and even the best predictive algorithm could have terrible performance. So don't just spend your time coming up with sexy solutions. Spend your time making sure they're correct before you worry too much about the sexy one. Okay? Okay, so real quick, we will just not look at the source code for it, but um, I'll go ahead and pull it up. We can run it. So we looked at all of this last week. There's some more files there now, but they're all pretty much the same. This pager-basic is the code that we looked at last week. It builds to a test.basic. It runs on process of time. It has terrible performance. These other pagers, dash LAU and dash predict, these are stubs. These, will be, these are the two files that you'll be modifying if you haven't already. Um, so these stubs are basically, this is just an LIU stub, it just exits with an error right now, but eventually it'll implement your LIU algorithm. This exits with an error right now, but eventually it'll implement your predictive algorithm. Feel free to make multiple copies of this. I mean, if you want to try out different predictors, I mean, you can copy these and maybe update the main file. But the main reason these are set up is so you don't have to modify the main file right off the bat. You only have to modify it if you decide you want multiple copies of some of these. So you get all of this, you go ahead and build it. And it generates some warnings right now from the stubs because they have unused variables. It's their stubs. You'll obviously want to make sure your code doesn't generate any warnings by either deleting these or as soon as you go to use them, it'll become a non-issue. Once it's built, you have these four test programs. We'll talk about the API one real quick. But this is the basic. This is the LU. This is the predict. If we run the LRU or the predict right now, it just exits with an error because it hasn't been implemented. Um, your goal is to essentially go into that file and pull out the code that exits and replace it with code that actually does something intelligent. So it's these two files are kind of the stubs that have been set up. That's where you'll be modifying your code. There's some stuff in them. You may or may not find it helpful. I mean, feel free to tear them apart. The stuff that's in here is just stuff that you might not have thought about that <coughs> About because you have to look at it. Is it global, uh, global static? I mean, is it, is it global across all that? Uh, well, it's, it's a static variable, so it's global across calls to this function. No, I mean, the global beyond the this yeah. file. So this is, I, I'm maintaining the tech company. Oh. I think if you look down here, we don't, we don't care because we're not doing anything. Yeah. We're just working. Yeah. I mean, the simulator has its own concept of a tick. Yeah. Uh, and in theory, these are probably synced up. They're not necessarily guaranteed to be, but yeah, you don't really have to keep track of them. So. Um, if we ran my solution from last week, that was this basic solution. It performs very poorly. Give it a sec. Um, just a note on duplicatability. Like I said, when you run this, you can run it with a dash help, and it actually has a whole bunch of options. This is a random C that generates each time, and that changes the way things are happening. If you're trying to isolate a bug, you can actually lock this seed in a specific value, which will ensure each time you run it, the exact same thing happens. Uh, so it tells you what seed it ran on. When we go to test it, you're not going to have the benefit of being able to pick your seed, but for testing it, it can be helpful. So this has really bad performance. It scores like a 14. Uh, the lowest score that gets you credit, I think you have to be under one. So this would get you no credit as is. Um, if we look at, I have a basic LRU solution that does OK. So if we run my LRU solution real quick, not looking at the code to give away too much. So this is a semi-decent LRU solution, and it scores, I remember we run it a couple of times, it tends to score between 0.3 and 0.4, which gets you, I have to look directly at that rubric, it's the rubrics and the PDF, but that gets you about half credit for the total number of points. Predictive would obviously go beyond this. The one last thing you may or may not find helpful, there's this test API program, essentially all it does is it just doesn't actually do any real paging. It just alternates between swapping a single page in and swapping a single page out and then updating the status set every time and printing it out. This basically allows you to prove that state diagram I drew on, on, on the board earlier. So if you don't believe that the state diagram actually does what I said it does, look at the output from this. It'll confirm that for you. You'll need to pipe in the less because it gets long. But I mean, you can essentially see it starts with the page swapped out. It then swaps the page in. 106 later, the page swap in completes, so on and so forth. So you can completely ignore this, but if you have questions about exactly what's going on in the API, you may kind of find the sequence of events that occur between swapping page in and swapping page back out useful. 
All right, thanks a lot, guys. Get started on this. It's due a week from tonight. Next week, we'll be talking about the next paragraph.